Thanks, Chris, for that introduction. And thank you, everybody, for coming and uh, showing an interest in, in our institute and what we do here. Um, it's always a pleasure to get to share um, with the public what we get to do. So I'm actually head of a lab called Human Comparative and Prostate Cancer Genomics. It's pretty much a mouthful. Um, but I'll touch today a bit on what we do in the human comparative side. So you've heard this morning um, a lot about genomics or genetics and how we study DNA. So you heard from Simon about the fruit salad. So if this is a human body, each body has a, um, each part of the body will have different cells that make up that body, and within each of those cells will contain a DNA code, and that's that's our DNA code that spells us. Now, if we took the DNA out of um, just one strand of DNA that makes up that code, it will pretty much be the length of, a, of an adult male, 1.8 meters long. So it's a very long code. That code contains 3 billion letters, roughly, that we get from mom, and 3 billion letters we get from dad. Uh, moms, you actually gave your children a little bit more, but don't tell dad because it's Father's Day soon. <laughs> but in any case, what we do in our lab, um, you heard from Luke, we're in the cancer um, screening, they look at specific cancer genes. You heard from Bella, where she has an interest in a specific gene um, because it's of relevance to her, the disease. In our team, we actually look at the entire code. We look at all six billion letters, so three billion from mom, three billion from dad. What we then do with that code, we look for differences or changes in the code. Now, usually when people think about these changes or differences in the code, they think of the word mutation, and then straight away they think X-Men. And they think, wow, dangerous, disease, or horrific. Now, I'd hate to tell you that just get a glancing through the audience, everyone, most people appear to be of uh, European or Asian descent. You carry probably 3.2 million differences or mutations uh, to the person sitting next to you. So you know, we all mutants, put it that way. <laughs> but why do we have all these changes? Well, these changes are actually the story of us and the story of our history. So mutations actually just naturally occur in our DNA, and they are, in, in essence, a clock. They are a clock about our history and a clock about who we are, and, um, and messages from our ancestors. Um, some of those changes are actually beneficial. They have resulted in our, us being successful as a human species. And of course, as you've heard this morning, some of them cause disease, and, and those are the ones we want to know about as well. So my team is interested in understanding the extent of this variation in what we call the human genome. Um, and I just have to quickly explain that when we say we are genomicists, and people say to me, but why do you say genomicists when you were all geneticists? Well, purely, we call ourselves genomicists now because we can read the entire code. Whereas geneticists in the past, we were just looking at specific genes, but we can look at the entire code now. So what do we do with this information? There's two things we, we want to do. Um, now, the uh, Garvin spends a lot of time studying disease and studying why that variation um, is, is impacted on disease. But of course, to understand disease, we've got to understand what it is to be healthy. So we also need to understand where we come from, who we are as modern humans. Um, so everyone walking around will have differences in their DNA code, and that will determine how healthy we'll be and also what diseases we'll carry. So we need to understand the complexities of that, and that's what we do. So what is it in the human code that actually spells human, right? So most of the DNA genetic work that we do here at the Garvin or in Australia is based around what we call recently diverged populations. Wow, you've heard a new term today. But basically that means everybody living outside of Africa is recently diverged. So what do we mean by that is when our ancestors left Africa, they went through a bottleneck. So just think of it as a big, bar of, big jar of jelly beans with all the different colors in it, representing all the variety of DNA and a few jelly beans just fall out of that jar. Those are the few jelly beans that make it out of Africa. They then populate the rest of the world, but you still not, you, you haven't got all that variety of color 
that was still in the original jar. So you've lost a lot of the genetic variation um, in, the, in the populations outside of Africa. So if we really want to understand the extent of human genome diversity, we have to go back to our origins and back to Africa. And this is what my team has been doing. So what is, um, uh, so in our lab, uh, we are using the differences, um, the differences in the human genome um, to actually understand our human ancestry. Now, a lot of you would have probably heard of Ancestry.com. It's pretty much the buzzword around Australia. I bet all of you got Christmas presents um, for Ancestry.com. Well, basically what we're doing in the lab is Ancestry.com on steroids. So Ancestry.com will tell you about your father and your you know, a few generations back, if you are of European ancestry. We want to go all the way back to the beginning. So most of the genetic data out there today starts at around 70,000 years ago when we left Africa. And we know a lot. Our ancestors left Africa. They met up with archaic species like Neanderthal. They met up with Denisovans. We intermarried or interdid something because their DNA is in us and so we have modern humans today. But modern humans are 200,000 years old, we know that. So what we're doing in our lab is we're trying to fill in the piece of the puzzle, is what happened from 200,000 years ago till the time we left Africa. So I told you that we use DNA like a DNA clock. Now when people think of human evolution and how we study how we came about, this is the picture that comes up. Now, if there is one thing I can teach you in this seminar, if you take nothing home from what I've said, please take home one message. This is the most incorrect picture that was ever, ever generated. <laughs> and I just quickly want to say why. So if ever you see it, you see someone wearing it on the T-shirt, go up to them and say, you're wrong. <laughs> now, the reason people thought this was the case is because chimps and humans share 99% of our DNA. So the theory was, oh, we evolved from chimps. Now, you've heard today from, from Luke about DNA sequencing. How did they know this information as geneticists and genomicists? Because they sequenced the DNA of a chimp, and they sequenced the DNA of human. When the chimp was sequenced, it was a chimp living in San Diego Zoo. When the first human who had his DNA sequenced was a chap called J. Craig Venter, who lives in San Diego, zoo. no, I'm sorry, not in the zoo. <laughs> he lives in San Diego, right? So of course, there was a lot of jokes about Craig and the chimp being related. Sure, they related, but they were related 5.2 million years ago. Craig did not evolve from the chimp. It's not possible because they're both living today. So what the real picture should look like is this on the left. And that's what we say, we shared a common ancestor with something 5.2 million years ago. What that common ancestor looked like, we don't know. So that is what we do in our lab. We do these trees trying to go back in time. So on the right is a picture from our lab of populations around the world. And we anchor that to the PAM in the chimp genome. And what we can see is Europeans and, and Asians lie at the very tips of the branches with the least genetic diversity. But what we could discover is the very first branching of modern humans. So in other words, people walking around today who carry a very, very distinct branch. Now, you may or may not know my lab about uh, nine years ago sequenced uh, two very influential genomes um, for the genetics field. One of them was the uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, and one of them was a gentleman called Tobi. Uh, that's it, just Tobi. And Tobi lives in the Kalahari in, in Namibia. And as I told you in the beginning, you all carry about 3.2 million DNA variants to the person sitting next to you. If the Archbishop was sitting um, next to Chris uh, this morning, he would have 4.2 million DNA differences to Chris. But if Booby was sitting on the other side of Chris this morning, he has 5.2 million DNA variants to Chris. So we needed to go back to Southern Africa if we really wanted to see the extent of our diversity, and that is what our um, team discovered. So I was fortunate to be able to, over a 10-year period, 
get on the plane many times and return to not only where I was born in South Africa, but also to one of the countries I love very dearly, which is a country called Namibia, or Nambia if you don't Donald Trump, but he hasn't got, <laughs> quite got that right. But anyway, it is Namibia. Um, this was a photograph I took from the window um, in the last trip in February. And as you can see, it's pretty much a country of very little. Very little out there, but most amazing people and the most amazing diversity. Um, so back, uh, traveling about 900 kilometers from uh, Vintuk, the main capital, or the capital of Namibia, um, I eventually land up in the Kalahari Desert, which is on the northern border of um, Botswana. Um, we've got sort of the Chobe Strip, so you've got Angola, and you've got um, Zambia, and then Zimbabwe. But this is the, the Kalahari Desert, and I'd like to introduce you to the Zutwasi. And I'd like to inform you that the Zutwasi are genetically the oldest people living today. So what do we mean about oldest? Because we're all the same, we're all modern humans. But they have the most genetic diversity than any other population in the globe, on the globe. They also, so that means they broke away from everybody else, and we have measured that to about 180,000 years ago. And they've maintained on their own genetic path. That's why they have such an amazing genetic diversity. They also still live as hunter-gatherers. They are the only group now left um, in Namibia and Southern Africa that are still allowed to hunt. Most of the groups still gather. And as you can heard from my uh, pronunciation of the Zutwasi, they are click speakers. So five major clicks in their language, 148 sub-clicks. It's pretty hard. Okay, so this is my lab in Africa. On uh, the left, we have the charging station for the, the equipment, which is in the car. We have the hotel on top of the car. We have the consultation happening over there, at, and you can see the table. We have the office, which is the same table. Um, you have me working with something, which I'll tell you later, which is also the same table. And we also have a freezer, which is a portable uh, minus 80 tank, um, which is quite interesting to find liquid nitrogen in a country like Namibia. Right. Um, so what have we been discovering besides um, telling the story of mankind and telling where we all come from? Well, we're actually telling, we're learning very important things about us as modern humans. Because we were all hunter-gatherers for 190,000 years. It's only in the last 10,000 years that actually everything changed. In the last 10,000 years when we started agriculture, was when diseases like smallpox, chickenpox, all these um, diseases were related to farming actually came about. 10,000 years ago is when we started living in communities and populations grew. A hunter-gatherer does not have a big population. They keep their populations at small numbers. So the challenges we are facing today are very different to the way we all were. So they are giving us um, signatures of our past and we can relate that to disease. And the two biggest things we are learning from their DNA is one, the immune system. When you, we were hunter-gatherers, we had to have a very strong immune system because we had to fight all the odds. There wasn't a nice Western doctor we could go to. And the second one is, is dietary and toxins. Now on the right, you'll see my lab. And pretty much it looks like a diet of beer. Uh, yeah, pretty much beer. And on the left, you'll see the diet of, of the hunter-gatherers still of the land. So we, we see incredible signatures in the human genome indicating these differences in the diet. And the last thing I just want to mention is that we are more than just the DNA that's actually in our cells. We are also the DNA that live in the bugs, that live in and on our body. And there are 10,000-fold more bugs living in us and on us than there is our own DNA. And that we call the human microbiome. And as you probably have heard, this biome, these bacteria and viruses and fungi living in the gut, will determine also our health. So we went back to the Kalahari, and we got these lovely people that are all going kaja, which means good. They've donated their, their stools. Um, and we managed to get the stools all the way from Namibia back to Australia to study their gut microbiome, biomes that have not been influenced by antibiotics, biomes that have not been influenced by hamburgers, beer, and all the lovely things that we eat. 
And this is just really what we saw. I'm not, I'm not going to teach you anything about genetics, but on the left at the bottom, you'll see that little bar chart being really far down. And on the right, in the green, you see one being really far up. Left down are Americans, poor, poor diet. Right top are hunter-gatherers, really far up. The ones far up say a lot of diversity, very healthy microbiome. Left bottom, terrible. So you can really see how these bugs that are living in us are actually helping us to be healthy. So um, all I'd like to say is I've taken you on a very quick whirlwind journey from a lab in the bush to this wonderful building here. Thank you very much. Thank you.